Yeah, I'm Aaron Hilliard. I'm the vice president. I'm the speaker seeker. So I try to find uh, interesting people to. Oop, I muted him. Oops, sorry. Okay, sorry. Muted. There you go. You're back. Okay. I think David did a pretty good job kind of telling the story. I, I was, I've just been searching for speakers and I reached out to uh, David Aurora, who's actually the author of a couple of really uh, famous mushroom guides, probably the most famous famous uh, pocket mushroom guide, all that the rain promises and more and mushrooms demystified. And anyways, he said that uh, he's not super familiar with Zoom, but um, that his partner would be willing to give a talk. And so that's how I got in touch with Wendy. And it turns out we've got some mutual friends on Facebook and she's well known in the mushroom community and stuff. And, uh, and so she's been all over the world traveling with David Aurora, eating mushrooms, learning about mushrooms in different cultures. And so she's going to give us a talk about that, which I am like incredibly excited about this talk just because uh, I love like learning about how other cultures use mushrooms and, uh, and just the cultural part of it. So really, uh, really happy that you're able to do this. And so uh, I would like to introduce uh, Wendy So to the Kitsap Peninsula Mycological Society. Thank you for the warm welcome, Aaron and David. Very happy to be here. And David is actually, Aurora is actually here with oh, me yeah. as well. He can say hi. You can come say hi. Hi there. Yeah. I'm here too. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say I'll save the hard questions for him. Okay. So let me just share my screen here and make sure that this, this stuff works. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. In big screen. Great. There may be a little bit of delay because we don't have the fastest internet here in the town that we're living in, but uh, just holler and let me know if there's some technical issues and we can pause or troubleshoot pretty quickly. So um, here's David and I, this is a pretty recent picture. We were out in um, Southwest picking bolites. So here you can see uh, three kinds. We have this red poor bolete, a white king bolete and their um, and their uh, version of um, porcini. So it was a really really great day that we found all three. And today I want or tonight I want to just give a talk on the tell three continents. So specifically, want to share my experience around mushroom culture and cooking and foraging in Southwest China as well as South Central Africa and how my experience like made me realize how different these places are and I would love to share that with you. Okay, first off, how are we alike and different? Um, I had to update this because the last talk I did was in California. So like I have some surprise fun facts from Washington as well. But and I and I didn't know what the Washington state flag looked like. And now I'm like, oh, that is the state of Washington flag. It <laughs> has Washington on it. So um, generally, if you look at the size difference, Zambia as a country is about double of Yunnan, which is a province in, in China and uh, compared to Washington. And then as a small, smaller of the three. And then in terms of elevation, you can tell that um, there are low lands to high mountains in Yunnan province. And you can see that maybe is uh, substantiated by sort of plant diversity estimates. There are 17,000 pl different plants in Yunnan, of which in China has like 30,000. So there's a lot of biodiversity there. And then if you look at Zambia and Washington, they're pretty similar in terms of native species. And I couldn't find the numbers and how many, how many are naturalized. So I, I was estimating like one site said 800. So just sort of like mushroom diversity, plant diversity, you can start to think about what that looks like. And then um, rainfall, Washington has a lot of very different landscapes and, and different range of rainfall. And there's the fall winter rains compared to Yunnan and Zambia is usually summer monsoon. They are uh, raining in the summer season. And then if you look at the population, um, Yunnan is 47 million, which seems a lot, but is very small in China because they have cities that are like up, up, upwards of a billion people. Um, and then Zambia has 17 million as a whole country, and then Washington has 7.6. For GDP, you can see here that um, Zambia is low GDP country, um, and then uh, Yunnan and Washington are, you know, Washington is double of Yunnan. 
And then some fun facts. I just realized today that there are more glaciers in Washington than the 47 contiguous state combined. And you have 10 volcanoes. And Yunnan is the birthplace of tea. So any tea that we're drinking, it comes, the birthplace comes from um, Yunnan. And then they have 350 species of rhododendron for those who like gardening. And then in Zambia, um, they have this famous Victoria Falls. It doubles the height of Niagara Falls and it's also wider and is the home to the big five wildlife. Those are looking for like safaris. That's where you can see them in Zambia. So let's talk a little bit about carbon emissions. I find this interesting about, you know, the whole um, looking at carbon emissions and, and where we are in, in contrast with the three different continents. Um, in, the, in, in the United States and Canada, it's 14.2 per capita. And then in Zambia is 0.4. And then in China is 7.4, but the Yunnan province is a much more rural area. So I suspect that the actual number in Yunnan province is lower than that. So it says a few things, right? We looked at the, the statistics on the uh, GDP and then also sort of like the advancement of the different countries that kind of reflects in, in what this looks like. And then it also makes me reflect on how does this impact mushroom hunting and mushroom culture and how do they view mushroom in general? So I came up with organizing this talk where how can we tell if we're in a mushroom loving culture and um, there are three things I want to get across today. One is, is there access to mushroom hunting? Um, is there only restricted areas or there's vast majority of areas that you can like freely mushroom hunt wherever you want? And then second, diversity of mushroom collected. How many kinds of different mushrooms are people collecting? And then do they know a few kinds or there are many different kinds and they have like all sorts of knowledge around the different kinds. In addition to having um, collecting different kinds of mushroom, how available are they? Do you find them in markets and restaurants? Um, are they readily available for mushroom pickers as well as non-mushroom pickers? So we can explore some of those topics today. Okay, so um, before I go into sharing my journey and different pictures, I wanted to just point out six things to watch for that really differs from mushroom hunting we have here. So first and foremost, mushrooms are picked whole. You can see here there's a basket or not a basket, just like a market tray of mushrooms. They are all picked whole and not cut. This is always true in Yunnan and uh, often true in Zambia. And then I don't see mushroom brushes used and then mushroom knives are very rare. So they just pluck the mushroom and then put it in the basket. I think partly, the, the reason for this is, um, at least in China, they like to have the product of perceived and seen as fresh as possible that is coming from the wild versus something that is not from the wild is store-bought, very clean cut, everything is uniform, same shape, same sizes. So it looks really pleasing to the eye, but for the uh, consumers in Yunnan, they see having a little bit of, of dirt and duff, it's uh, a sign of freshness. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Then um, second thing is only the common names are used, uh, except for scientific liter literature and um, in periodic jur journals that only common names are used wherever we went in Yunnan and also in Africa. They don't know any of the, the uh, Latin names. So they use only their, their local names. And I just can paste this, this um, page of a European journal of agriculture that shows the scientific name that scientists use to differentiate the different kinds of mushrooms. But if you look at the, the names in the local language, Kibemba or Columba, like all of the different chanterelles are just essentially called Britondo. Britondo. It's like any chanterelles is like Britondo and they know it's edible and they collect them and it's, they, to them it all gives the same name. Uh, number three, Kids, kids help in all phases of um, collecting mushrooms. That's what we've seen as a theme. We have the kids that help the hunting, the cleaning, and the prepping. You can see here on the left, um, this girl collecting beautiful chanterelles. Um, 
they 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 they're the most beautiful fragrance chantrel that I've seen that she was collecting. And then um, the kids helping to wash mushroom, they're washing some rusulas there in, in China. And then also in Zambia, this this girl's cooking uh, amanita in like a little cook stove. They don't, they they they're cooking, they don't really have a separate kitchen, but they have these movable cooking stoves that they burn charcoal in and then they just cook on top of it. As you can see, there's like two stoves there and they're just made of metal with holes and it's very um, rustic. Number four, um, we talked about the uh, carbon emissions and this is just to depict that very few people have their own cars in Yunnan and also in Zambia. Mostly they walk to mushroom hunt. All right, David just, brought over a stove for demonstration. This is how the stove looked like. <laughs> so very, very few people drive. So most people just walk out of their village to um, go mushroom hunting or they, they carpool in little uh, wagons and such. I, I don't know how many people they loaded in this, this like three wheeler to go mushroom hunting together in near Tibet. So this is, it's a much greener activity, but for, for us in contrast here, I mean, we would have, I would have to, if I, I my, my, when I lived in San Francisco, I would have to drive three, four hours to go mushroom hunting and then come back. So it was not a very green activity. So we'll try to get people to go with us as well so we can pack up the car. Number five, mushrooms are routinely soaked or washed and then they're not afraid to boil them. So we've seen that um, a lot of uh, in a lot of restaurants and on the streets, they just wash the mushrooms and rinse them multiple times to get the grit out. And then, um, and then they just cook them down um, if they wanted to be in the, in the stir fry or they just actually cook them in, in their own juices and broth. So on the right here, after the mushrooms were washed, they are making a hot pot. So they do like a, a nice bone broth stew and then throw different mushrooms in there to boil it and then just have it like a soup. And finally, they use all sorts of container to carry mushrooms. It's not just limited to, to baskets. As you can see here, uh, this lady that's holding a um, Amanita mushrooms also have like a wash tub carrying on top of her head of some lactarious mushrooms. And then in China, they have baskets as well as um, plastic bags that they use as easy to carry that they walk around the forest with. Okay, I'm going to pause here before we go to Yunnan, China for any questions on the on what I've presented so far. I need to just oh, hello. Yeah, this is Colleen. I thought amanitas were poisonous. Are they not poisonous around the world? So that's a great question because a lot, a lot of amanitas are eaten around the world and there are certain species of amanita that are deadly poison that we, if, if it's accidentally eaten, like the amanita phylloides, it could cause death and you would need uh, a kidney transplant to have a chance to survive. So there are a couple or three or four really poisonous ones to avoid. So when I first learned mushroom hunting, the deadly poisonous amanitas are the ones that I learned first. So I learned to avoid those. And then as I got more comfortable um, in mushroom hunting, I started, you know, trying different edible amanitas uh, that are not being sold on the markets, of course, but they it's are, really they could be very tasty. So my follow-up question is, are there amanitas in the Pacific Northwest that are deadly poisonous and we can eat them? Um, deadly poisonous amanita in Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Are there? Yeah. Are non-deadly poisonous amanitas in the Pacific Northwest ones oh, that are yeah. safe to eat? Yeah, sure. yeah, there is. So, um, I uh, there I think there's kokora that grows in in the Pacific Northwest, and um, Aaron and David Ansley can check me on this, but that's, that's a really delicious mushroom. Yeah, I, I don't know if it makes it this far north, but we have like the Western Grisette, the Raginata group of Amanitas that are edible, but not super popular for people to eat. And of course you can prepare Muscaria if you know what you're doing, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have a Kokora this far north. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So the Amanita muscaria is an interesting one because it's one that you could detoxify by boiling 
twice in copious amount of water, dump out the water and then um, pan fry it and then throw it in any dish you want. So I've been eating Amanita muscaria for a while and um, haven't had any um, ill effects. And it's quite good. And then like maybe the next time I can generate a talk and talk about um, our Amanita muscaria adventure in, in Japan. Uh, that was a really good story, but I'm gonna zero in and focus on, um, on China and Africa. Do you, know, do you know what the species was of those chanterelles? They were so pretty. They look like agrosophy or something. I've never seen. Yeah. So in, in Zambia, they have 50 species of chanterelles. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. So it's the, the center of like the world of chanterelle diversity. And they have many, many different kinds compared to just the five kinds we have yeah. in the Pacific Northwest or the, the West Coast of the United States. But they have 50 and so um, the name of the chanterelle that looks like a hygrophorus, that's called oh, cantharellus. Africantharellus. Oh, wow. I want to look that up. Cool. Yeah. I, I have a question. How did you find the places where you went? And did you stay there with the people? And did you eat what they cooked? Oh, yes. So um, I... I'm just a tagger longer uh, at David's travel, David Roar's travel. So he's been there before. So he's established relationship with uh, different places that he's visited. And so we would stay in um, rental cottages and then we would have people that we, we travel together with um, and ride with. And then we would uh, make friends with villagers who would invite us to their house and, and uh, serve us meal and we eat together and, and yes. talk together. And then in Yunnan, um, because I can speak and David can speak a little bit of the language, it's easier to communicate. So we would um, stay with the villagers uh, sometimes if it's further away for, for them to access different places, we'll have to hike a while. So I, I remember we, we didn't know what to expect, but they invited us to stay and have dinner. And for the first time in my life, I was sleep, sleeping on hay bale in a garage. I, didn't, I wasn't sure what to expect and I wasn't expecting much, but you know, they, they have um, David sleeping in like a nice quarter and I was sleeping in hay bales next to, next to a pig farm area, but he got the, he, he got more royal treatment because they, you know, respect him as, you know, uh, just the authority of more authority figure and I was you know like learning and, and trying out different things so it was a it was an experience for sure and and they make really wonderful food and they 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 love to share they're very generous for all of the different tours and meals that they like invited us to they would not like receive or take any any money that we mm -hmm. we, we given them they just want to share the experience and make friends and have that connection with someone who are also interested in, in mushrooms and what they're doing. That's cool, that is cool. But I would have expected David to give you then a nice bed and go to the hay bowl. <laughs> we were together. I, we were really together then. We were just kind of like friends and okay. traveling. <laughs> um, Wendy, I wanna pass along a question from the chat um, from Tina having to do with, you mentioned how most of those mushrooms were being boiled. And she wondered, is that because they're going, they're being prepared a different way for um, specifically for soup? Is that why they boil them or do they boil them even if they're gonna be using them in other ways? Oh yeah, that, that is a, a way of um, just cooking. I think the reason why we, I put that up there is that a lot of times oh, here, yeah. We don't, we don't tend to boil mushroom. We don't tend to wash mushroom, but for them, it's just another way of cooking. They treat it like almost like a vegetable, like some vegetables we can boil, like we boil carrots or we can just fry up carrots or bake them. It's very much used the same way. They don't separate out, you know, you can't, you can't wash a mushroom. You have to use a fine brush and brush the dirt away and they must not get wet. They don't have that concept. So it's just a way of cooking it. And they have the, they, they, they um, will boil it in soup or they use it in hot pot, but they also have just regular straight stir fry or frying the mushroom. It's just a way of cooking. Hmm. Okay. I follow a, a YouTuber from Yunnan, China, and they and it seems like so many uh, species of lactarius, like they love picking those lactarius mushrooms. And then, like you said, they, they wash them like crazy. So I was a little bit surprised to see those dirty mushrooms with the base still intact. Uh, 
in that bin because the way they wash them so vigorously and you know, like you said it's kind of taboo here to wash your mushrooms and over there i'm like kind of cringing watching them wash all these mushrooms but they they love yeah. their like, they wash them right they 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 would wash them right before it's cooked so when they're storing them in the fridge transporting them is with all the dirt and stuff huh interesting can we move to china and then save questions for later okay where is yunnan so here's a map of china yunnan is in the southwestern tip of china and it borders vietnam laos and burma and um, also tibet as well and, and and india in that area there and um and then you can see here, they have high mountains with snow. They also have kind of tropical, really lush areas and they have hardwood and different diversity. And then there's also, um, they have two dozen ethnic minorities there um, living in Yunnan. So there's a different types of people living there with different ethnic minority and different traditions. So that's pretty cool. As you can see, this lady has a, their own costume. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to show you pictures and just hang on a second while I try to, to do this in a in an okay fashion. Let me see. Okay. Can you see a picture? Yes. Okay. So I'm sure you've seen these signs. I see a lot of it in California. We have the no mushroom picking signs postered all over. So when we talk about access to mushroom hunting, I think there is a difference here in how, how many places we're allowed to hunt mushrooms versus other places. So here is a, a private property sign for warning mushroom pickers to keep out. <laughs> And here is uh, another one uh, from uh, telling us that the area is patrolled by naturalists. So please do not pick the mushrooms. In contrast, I wanted to show a sign from China. This is from a park. And what you see here is an introduction to the park. And in Chinese, it tells all of the different common names of the mushrooms. And then I blew up the next slide in larger font so you can see they also provide Latin names to the plants, as well as the common mushroom species. For, for those of us who can't read the Chinese and appreciate the Latin, there is Latin there. And then if you notice the last sentence on the bottom, it tells you about what the average annual yield of mushroom is um out of that that area so it says masutaki there's 250 kilograms and other mushroom 260 kilograms and annual annual yield of different wild mushrooms so they're encouraging people to get to know the different mushrooms there and then letting them know that it's you know a place you can pick and there's like different things that you can see there this is a um, typical scene in yunnan where uh, there is some agriculture so you can see some um, agriculture going on around the, the forest and, and villages are in between. So when we talk about access and sort of the greener aspects of these areas, as people just walk out of their village, they can do their work and do the farming. And when they have downtime or early in the morning, they can just walk to the forest and pick their mushrooms. Here's a, another aerial shot of that. So forest and um, edges of a farmland. And see, here's this, uh, a typical villagers uh, doing his walks and then picking mushrooms when he can to either sell or eat themselves. Here's a village lady carrying a bucket with mushrooms. And here's other villagers with mushrooms. And, and this, is, this one is interesting because uh, she's carrying mushrooms, different types. She's picking different types of mushrooms in buckets and then also in plastic bags. And then the wooden uh, branch that she's holding, that's also for cooking. So she used that as wood for uh, cooking in her kitchen. So she's carrying a lot of different things, a lot, lots going on there. And then uh, this is one of the ethnic minorities there, <laughs> ye minorities collecting um, 
these uh, woolly chanterelles and they eat them there. And here's a flevopus that's being collected. And then you can tell between villagers and the city people that go, you know, and do their collecting, they're much cleaner with their white shoes and baskets and casts. They're very clean looking and they, they went mushroom picking with us as well. And um, they do like to carpool, even on a, a, a motorbike with uh, three buckets of mushroom for three people. <laughs> and there's around and around the mountains to, to collect their mushrooms. And here we are in a, uh, like a little three wheeler with some villagers who invited us to their homes before um, me sleeping on the hay bale. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and so this, this picture was taken in the Pacific Northwest where um, authority troopers like looking at the mushrooms and making sure that the right size and there's not like over the limit um, so I tried really to avoid rangers and stuff. Cause I mean, even though I have a permit and stuff, it doesn't feel like you're free to, to roam. And then when we were in China, for example, we were escorted by police to go mushroom hunting. We were having tea in this little town and we talked about mushroom hunting. And then one of the, the, the women who was behind me said, Hey, I want to go mushroom hunting. And, and, um, my, my father can take us. He's a policeman. So then we just went in a police car to go mushroom hunting. So it's a very different um, celebration of, you know, let's get mushroom. That's really fantastic. So we, we were, that was my first time hunting in a police car. And then after the hunt, they invited us to a lunch and the lunches are pretty elaborate. So this is cooked by the policemen where there are um, seven, six dishes we're eating together and sharing a meal. And if you are wondering what's going on, we're behind this wooden counter in the police station and you see the policemen out there and there's like um, civilians in line. This is their equivalent of a DMV where they're coming to like fill out their test forms and then they get their tests and we're eating behind that together and just having this meal is super informal. So here's the next picture of um, villagers gathering again, uh, just out of um, their villages into nearby, collecting a lot of different types of rusula. And the grandma is teaching her grandkids like which ones are good, which are different kinds. And um, here are you know kids helping out. And in, in Yunnan, they pick mushrooms, but they're also very interested in um, they eat the hornet larvae. I think. If you're thinking of uh, these, like the, they're called murder hornets here, but in, in Yunnan, they it's a it's a food that they eat. So the kids would just pick the larvae out. You can see this little maybe two year old using a tweezers, and then the big sister is like teaching the kid like how to pull out the larvae, and that's uh, used for food. Gee, I can't even get my kid to eat strawberries, man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can start something radical like larvae. <laughs> and here is um, villagers are picking the mushrooms and then weighing in to, to buyers that will come to the village and buy up the different mushrooms to go to the market. So um, instead of like here, I think the commercial pickers will pick the mushrooms and then bring it to a buyer. Over there is the opposite. The the buyer will go to individual villages and buy up the mushrooms and then collect it. And then the, the buyer would then take it to the market to sell. So this is like a, a typical village scene where the buyer is looking at the different mushroom, weighing them out. And um, mushroom loving culture, they just love and they're very proud of the mushroom. This is a mural in Yunnan um, province. So this is a map of Yunnan province. And you can see in this mural where their mushrooms are with respect to the Yunnan province. So then in one, in the Northern area, they have like more bolites in the Southern area. They have like, um, uh, what is that one? Like, a, is that a Matsutake? Oh, in the North is a Matsutake there. And then, Bolitza. and then there's bolites in the South. And then on the uh, East side, there's some um, Ganoderma. And then on the West side, there's some uh, morels and some truffles. Here's another mural, 
And they, they try to paint the mural where I notice that is less fantastical. I think here in, in San Francisco, I see mushroom murals a lot, but it's really fantastical in the nature of Super Mario Brothers or Alice in Wonderland. They try to here paint sort of like the, the um, like the life and, and the village that they have. So here you see a lady picking mushroom, sorting mushroom, weighing mushroom, and then someone stringing them to dry. And here is a mural of people washing mushroom. Don't look, Aaron, look, just pouring all this water on the mushroom <laughs> and cleaning them. So they clean it and then they wash it really nicely. Um, yeah, so this is just a mural there. And uh, this is a one that's weighing different mushrooms and sorting. So in this picture, I think it's boletes and termite mushrooms. And you can see that the, the ethnic minority is doing the sorting and, and, and cleaning while the one in the back, more of a city person, like reading the newspaper. <laughs> yeah. And here is a mural of um, termite mushrooms and they are really delicious. So if you have a chance to go to Yunnan, China, definitely try these, they're the sweetest mushrooms. And here's a mural of different color bolites and termite mushrooms on the left. And it reminded me of the ladies that are picking mushrooms that we met because they're dressed like mushrooms in the next picture. Voila. <laughs> okay. So that's all about um, access and where mushrooms are access. The next series of pictures that I'm gonna show you is about mushroom diversity. Let me just watch this. Culture, yeah, sorry. I think I clicked on something funny. One second. Okay. So there is, um, Yunnan is like, has a lot of different mushrooms and there's a huge diversity that's showing you they have varying elevation as well as uh, different plant species. So there's many, many different kinds. And here are some villagers picking, as you see in their basket, there must be seven or six different kinds that they have here. Here's a lady with a bucket and they eat a lot of coral mushrooms. They call them sopajin, which literally means broom mushroom because they look like little brushes and, and brooms and they eat that a lot. And then there's boletes in here and other kinds that she's been collecting for her family. Here is a, a, a group of um, boletes and rusulas. And here's our basket. We found this on one of our hikes different amanitas, brucellus, and coral. And here's a man with his little mushroom tool that he kind of put together to, to kind of find mushrooms among all the grass. We might be disappointed in that, but yeah. 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 So we, um, tools that they use to dig mushrooms, I, I, I've heard that, you know, like it's, it's frowned upon here um, but he uses this tool every day to help push things. And I think for, for people who are older, elder as well, it's harder to bend over. So it's easy just to like brush things off and see if there is a mushroom before using that energy to like get, get into the area. Cause you can see in the back here, there's some pretty thick bushes that he has to get through, but that's part of their culture. Here's his basket with different kinds that are all edible. Here, here's, they, and they go out and pick every day. So they don't, they pick for what they need uh, per day to eat. So they don't pick a, a big amount. As you can imagine, if you live right next to a place where you can just pick mushrooms and you can pick it fresh and cook it every day versus if I'm leaving from San Francisco, have to go to like Shasta to pick mushrooms. I need to pick as many as I can because when is the next time I'm going to drive up there again? So I, I tend to pick a lot and then spend all night cleaning and then dehydrating for a couple of days, but they're, they have the luxury of just being and picking fresh and eating kind of like forced to table every day. Yeah, just wanna show some diversity. So I'm gonna skip these through pretty quickly. Here's an Amanita, they eat Amanitas and this is one of edible Amanitas. Ganoderma, and this is interesting. This is uh, the earth stars. So they eat earth stars there. So there's a lot of squirrel dermas. Earth balls. Earth balls. 
sorry, not stars, earth balls. So it's more diversity of different stuff that they eat. Here is like their um, man on a horseback and some Lactarius. Bolites. And look at the bolete diversity. They eat all sorts of bolites, including red ones. And um, on the left here, just want to highlight this left mushroom is a telephora. So it's a polypore. Um, or was it not polypore? Telephora? Yeah, that they eat is a very fragrant mushroom. It's one of the most expensive mushrooms in China. So they, they, you know how there's like truffles that are expensive in, in France and China, the telephora is one of the most expensive mushrooms because it's um, very fragrant and it's valued by their fragrance and they use it usually in the hot sauce because it provides an extra depth to their hot sauce. And then they, they, they love that mushroom. So this is a telephora. It's a little bit chewy and very fragrant. And then on the right is the termite mushroom. So the termite mushrooms are um, symbiotic with termites. So the termites help cultivate the mushrooms. More diversity in different buckets here. Um, and they, they wash all the mushrooms together and then they cook the mushrooms together. They don't separate the different kinds and cook different kinds, just cook everything together. Hey, and now I will take you to the markets and restaurants in Yunnan. This is great, especially um, especially um, if you haven't eaten, it's gonna make you hungry. So this is this is a typical restaurant scene where typically they they don't have like menu that you look at. They just post a big plaster on the wall in Yunnan. They can look to see what kind of mushrooms they have and they can order those mushrooms. And then this is this is just um, a grill. We can order mushrooms or tofu, and then they have a, a grill right in front of the store and you just grill fresh and eat it right then and there. And um, this is what I talked about before where they keep the dirt on the mushroom and they like to duff. So you're almost like picking your mushrooms in the market because you have to go through the pine needle and look for the mushrooms that you want. Yeah. And this is part of the grill. They use the pine needles to grill lactarius. So it, there's an infusion of that pine smoky flavor. And they do the same in the back here with tofu. And they're all over a lot of the streets in Yunnan where you can have like grilled mushrooms and grilled vegetables and grilled tofu off the streets. And uh, like I said, they don't have menus, but they do have when you walk in huge coolers and refrigerators where there are fresh washed mushrooms or you can just point to what you want. So here you can say, I want some top greens here. These are pumpkin greens and I want some of these mushrooms and some gambagin mushrooms. And then they'll just cook it for you. You just point to what you want and they'll just cook it. Or you can bring your mushrooms to the restaurant and they'll clean it and cook it for you. So I, I don't know of any restaurants here that are willing to cook and clean and cook the mushrooms for us to, to eat. Cause I think there's some liability issues and they don't typically do that unless you're friends with the chef. But the, over there is a very common thing where you can bring your ingredients and they'll cook it and just charge you for the, for the labor. More washing mushrooms and washing vegetables at the same time. Yeah, lots of washing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting in Yunnan, uh, most of the preparation is very similar in terms of how they cook the mushrooms. They like to make them in stir fry and they're Two favorite ingredients in cooking mushrooms is um, chili pepper and garlic. So in a lot of these pictures of different mushrooms that are cooked is you'll see chili pepper and garlic. It accompanies like very well. So you can see these are three different dishes with th three different kinds of mushroom. There is some pepper. This is not a spicy one, but they use pepper and then there's garlic. And then this is a spicy pepper and garlic. And then there's like chili and, and and garlic in here. More um, mushroom. This is a lacaria. Mm. And here's lactarius. And this is a um, 
a bamboo mushroom. They're also called stink horn mushrooms, but it, they grow with bamboos. And there's, this is a very popular preparation where they cook it in soup. And the hot pot. And the bamboo mushrooms in the hot pot. And more garlic and chili stir fried mushroom. Very good. And what happens is like there's a consistent baseline flavor of garlic and chili is the mushroom that is different in everything that you're tasting. And uh, bringing you to the market, this is a typical market scene. It was overwhelming because I've never seen so many scrollists in my life on one pile. But as I was describing to you, when the um, buyers, they go around the villages, they collect different kinds that they think that their market wants. There's a, a demand of certain kinds. And I guess in this market, a lot of people like Swillis. So there's a pile of Swillis here for sale. And um, this man is selling Amanitas, different kinds of Amanita in the market. And just more of the market scene where different vendors are selling different kinds of mushrooms. Yeah. It's almost like going to a fungus fair because there are so many different kinds. This is the telephora I was telling you about, Kalkamba gene. That's very popular with the hornet's larvae and different kinds of bolites. More bolites and, and chanterelles. And uh, more dishes with pepper, chili, garlic, mushrooms. And this is their butter bolete, more butter bolete. And um, here's a more fancy restaurant that actually comes with a picture of different mushrooms that you can order. Yeah. And um, washing of bolete and soaked up. And this is a really delicious uh, green russula that they really like locally. They're really good. Highly recommend that one too. If you want a list of mushrooms to try, you will get that at the end of this talk. Ooh. Yeah, just, and um, this is tremella, dry tremella that they grow and dry. And these are all cultivated mushrooms from China. And I think this one is like cordyceps, the long yellow one. What are the dark brown? Oh. These ones? Yeah. Why is David? Uh, they're called Zerula Rumensiella. Zerula Rumensiella. <laughs> <laughs> like I can tell you, they were they were for sale in the in the lo local Berkeley Bowl here. Is that a that guild there. mushroom or a bully? Sorry, I'm just interested. Oh no worries, this is a guild mushroom. Oh, I see it right there. Okay. Yeah, cool. this one here. Yeah. Okay. And this is the uh, bamboo mushroom or the the stink horn. Phallus insidiala. So, so what they do is they grow these. These are com um, commercially grown. And then they use a hose to rinse off all the gleba. And then it becomes all white or they cut it off and then you can eat the stem part, which is really flavorful. So if you like, kind of like when you eat morales, a lot of the, the, the flavor of the morale is like the way it's shaped that all like when it captures like sauces, it's, it's the texture. And with this bamboo mushroom it's the same on the bottom, it has this interesting texture that captures a lot of different flavors. So it, it makes it really delicious. There's more telephora, chanterelles with almost no, no gills, false gills or not. That's their chanterelle. And um, this is a really delicious polypore. They call the tiger's paw. Yeah. I think you have them in Washington. Yeah. This one, Scooter. Scooter. Yeah. And they, it's very popular there. And there's the Matsutake. I guess we call those number ones. <laughs> and uh, here's the termite mushrooms. Lots of termite mushrooms. And I just love how they are fully display how much, how much time they put in just to, to put it all in, in these little bamboo plates to, to sell in the market so you can get a nice look to see which one you want. Yeah, more market shots. I got a lot of pictures. Let me know if I'm doing okay on time because I haven't gotten to, to Zambia yet. <laughs> oh, you're fine on time. This is, this is uh, pouring to us. 
Okay. So here, here's a man who, who is a small market seller. He only have a little bit of each kind and he is happy selling it to us, different <laughs> ones. Very happy. Yeah, and here's a, a big termite, termite mushroom. mushroom. They have these tap roots that goes deep down. So do they raise the termites and then the termites grow the mushrooms or do they need to wild forage you go find wild termite mounds to find the mushrooms on? Wild termite mounds, they are living, they're uh, cultivating the mushroom, the termites are. Wow, okay. Yeah. Yeah, red rusulas, they, they like them a lot too. And more bullets, it's overwhelming <laughs> how, how many mushrooms there are during the mushroom season. And all the different kinds. Yeah. And how many kinds they eat that you can try. This is a pile of butter bullets that they're cleaning. How can this be possible to sell this in one day? And if it is such a pile, then all the mushrooms in the middle underneath, they must be smushed. They dry them too. They clean and dry them. Huh. So I think a lot of the, the dried mushrooms being sold in, in Europe sometimes are from Yunnan. They'll say package in France or package in Italy from, and then they list the countries and then they'll have like China, Ukraine, or like Poland or whatever. It's like all over, they're mixing it all together. Well, keep in mind, I got 50 million people compared to R7. <laughs> they could probably eat a few more mushrooms there. There's a lot of people. Huge, yeah, and here you can see, um, Kirsten, there's all the dried ones. So the, the ones that they, they um, had that pile, they have like a crew to wash, clean, cut, and then dry, and then they sell the dry mushrooms as well. Can I ask what time of year this is? In July. So they have monsoon season, so July, August. Here's a red poor mushroom that they eat there. Ruba Bolitis. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Now, now um, I'm going to pause for questions about China before I go to to Africa. Um, Wendy, th that market was that a weekly market or sort of an annual whoop de doo? I mean, the volume of those mushrooms yeah, yeah, yeah. and freshness was amazing. How do they do that? It's every day during the mushroom season. So it's, uh, and, and it's also like growing up in multiple, multiple towns, the, the, the volume there, it's just unbelievable, staggering, it's overwhelming just to see how many there are in the different towns in the mushroom season, because when the mushroom season comes, everyone goes and collect and there's this kind of frenzy and all of the mushroom, uh, mushroom market is open and they call it the mushroom wholesale market because that's where they, they're processing the market, sorting everything and then selling some, um, locally and then they sell the to the rest of china as well so they like ship it in these coal boxes to major cities and restaurants and stuff so it's, it's a huge production well i would add something there okay actually uh, <clears throat> excuse me she was showing uh, various market shots there from the wholesale market anytime that you saw big mounds of the same kind of mushroom. That's a wholesale market. But there were also many shots from little town markets every day, all day during the summer. And in those ones, the mushrooms are in smaller quantities of each kind, often, often jumbled together. So that's, and then there are buyers that come to those and buy them up and then take them to the city, to the wholesale market. To yeah. Certain kinds. So it's certainly a, a big part of the economy. They're mushroom picking, mushroom foraging, and the commercialization and the movement of them, you know, and to keep it fresh, like you said, it, it, they move around a lot. Cool. I, I have a question, and it kind of reflects a question that was asked earlier in the chat, but I noticed, you know, those red russulas that we, we I think it's the russula medica, like the, the sickener, we would call it that, the Turbinellus flocosus and the sclerodermas and the corals and the red poor mushroom. Like a lot of these we consider to be poisonous or toxic here. Uh, are, do you think they're genetically different mushrooms there or maybe their system, their digestive system is more used to it or do they cook them longer? Or how do you explain how they're eating all these mushrooms we would consider to not be edible? 
Yeah, I think, um, and, and David can share his opinion. Uh, my personal opinion is that it's a cultural thing. I think the we, we are probably more afraid of trying different things or there are books that, had said that are not good to eat or something. And we tend to not try it and just believe it on face value, but they don't have well, mushroom books there like we do here and they are more like in the village and they they've they've eaten this for for um different generations and they enjoy it and it's being sold on market and they use it so then they just i don't i don't think there's a genetic difference yeah. except for just a lab not they don't have that fear yeah, yeah. example the scaly chanterelles the turbinellas so they have a long history of eating them so at some point many generations ago they figured out there's a way to cook them that you don't get sick. And here, because somebody gets sick, that's more than one person gets sick, then we just say, oh, you can't eat that poisonous, blah, 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 blah. But there, they had this tradition of eating it, and it's no big deal. Interesting. Cool. Maybe I need to try more turbinellus this fall <laughs> um well i tried to uh, cook, it, yeah. uh, cook it well and then so what i what i do with turbinellus last season when i get them i don't eat a tremendous amount because you know i i want to be careful so but they are a little tart so i tend to cut them in little strips and then make it in hot and sour soup because they have a little tart flavor so i thought the hot and sour soup would yeah. accentuate their flavor a little bit so we can get creative with you know just try a little bit and if it doesn't affect you at all then i'm like oh it's okay to eat but i wouldn't eat anything in large amounts right so yeah yeah cool thank you that's a good recipe yeah i love that way just regular golden chanterelles mess me up so i got nothing to lose by trying turbinellus you know <laughs> well turbinellus is actually related to the coral mushrooms so not even not even related yeah yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Any other questions in China before we move to Zambia? All right. Let's go there. Where is Zambia? So here is just a quick overview. This is continent of Africa. Zambia is right uh, there in this kind of lavender color next to Malawi and Zimbabwe. And this is the um, central region of Africa. And what I wanted to show and blow up on this map is you see this grayish region all over the sub-Saharan Africa is where uh, mycorrhizal mushrooms are. So they like their mycorrhizal with the brachystesia. Um, and they call um, in Biamba, their local language, they call that the Miambo woodland. And they have um, a lot of different like legume species that are mycorrhizal with mushrooms. And I'll show you some that that uh, that that chanterelle, the Afro cantarellus, love to grow with this uopaca. And I have pictures left to show you. But this is this is where it is. And Zambia is a relatively safe, I think, area to travel. And um, it's easy to to kind of navigate. Um, I have not been to any other place besides Zambia. David's been to Zimbabwe and Mozambique, but this is really central to where the mushroom diversity is in, in Africa. So now so we'll switch over to Africa. Okay, I'll enlarge that picture. So this is um this is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. This is typical mm -hmm. what it looks like in Miyamo woodlands. You see these trees. These are a lot of different legume trees. And this is where you can find a lot of the different mushrooms that are within these trees. And they're cut by different rivers. And here are some termite mounds in Africa. They can actually see their little hills and their termite mounds. And if they're active in live termite mounds, the mushrooms will grow during mushroom season with rain. And like the murals um, in China, uh, in Zambia, they really love their mushroom as well. So they incorporate that in like everyday folk art. And here you can see some various different kinds of mushrooms in their folk art here. And then um, just wanted to point out that this is really like for my perspective and also to share their per capita um, 
carbon emission is 0.4 compared to 14 in US and seven ish in China. But they do, um, because they don't have readily available uh, electricity and heat, they do cut down the trees to make charcoal. So they'll be able to use that as heat and as cooking fuel. So what happens with the, with the, with the, um, charcoal processing, it reduces the availability of mushroom hunting habitat, and then people have to walk further from the village to actually get to the mushroom habitats that they want to hunt in. And here are pictures of kids collecting mushrooms and just out of the village. Again, they, they don't have cars, so they just do a lot of walking and um, all walks of life collect mushrooms. Here's a happy lady with a with a wash tub on her head with chanterelles. I don't know how they balance that on the head and run. I tried and failed miserably. Here's the mother collecting uh, amanita. And this is a really delicious amanita that they love. A family going out and collecting different kinds of amanita here. And they have access just outside of the villages. They can collect their mushrooms for dinner or inside their house. So this is, a, this is a termite mushroom, a small termite mushroom inside someone's house. So you can see it's below a desk in the computer and they have these um, termites cultivating the mushrooms and it's growing out of their, their house inside. And it's a delicious treat that this lady is collecting for, for her meal. And this is her bedroom. And then the termite mushrooms are growing inside their house. And they don't have electricity. A lot of the villages don't have electricity. So they, they use the sun to dry their mushroom and preserve their mushroom. And talk about um, diversity. So here's some um, Amanita diversity. This is their red bleeding Amanita. They call the Lavosa. And here's our friend Marjorie with a bucket of Velosas. Not velosa, lavosas, <laughs> amanita velosas. And this is um, a uh, truffle that they eat and collect. This is a picture to show you the bolete diversity there. So they have, these are all boletes. You can see that they have different colors, different shapes. There's some blue green poured ones, they have um, orange top ones, and they have black staining ones. And they have ones with like veil over them, the Afro, Afro camp, Afro boletus. <laughs> and yeah, these are all different boletes that they have there. Many different kinds there as well. Some red poor boletes. Chanterelle and bolete diversity. So there's um, one, two, three, four, maybe five mm -hmm. different kinds of chanterelles there in that basket, different colors. This is a, a poisonous amanita. It's a, it, the picture doesn't do its justice, but it's fluorescent pink. It's a very, very noticeable when you're hunting and you see some highlighted pink mushrooms in the ground and it's this poisonous amanita. And this is all edible amanita, the middle <laughs> one. The, the middle one is called tente, which is a really loved prized amanita mushroom. They call tente that they eat. And then the villagers were telling us that all these other mushrooms, there are other Amanitas, they call them the husbands of Tente. So I guess Tente is a female and then all the other little mushrooms are male. Here's um, more Amanitas they call Akafita. And this is very popular with kids because it's easy to identify, it's yellow and it's delicious and the kids love to grill them up. Here's uh, another Amanita that's edible called the gum gum free. And it's really weird. They have these spikes on it and it's very powdery. There's them. Um, this is like their big gazette. They call umpumvia. More of this pink poisonous one. And this is a red poor bolete that is edible in Africa. And the grisettes here, more, more grisettes, really big ones with big cups. We don't know really what species they are. A lot of these are undescribed. 
lactarius, um, black staining, edible, and a carton of Amanita eggs. Look at all the different colors from kind of copper to brown to silver. And these are different kinds of chanterelles. There are these really tiny ones that are chanterelles. They have these bigger ones, they have the whitish ones, the pinkish one here, and then this kind of black chanterelle. So these are all chanterelles. More different chanterelles, some with really deep grooves as gills, some less so. Some has little pointed, pink, pink toided stems. Yeah, just want to give a flavor of the different ones that we found there. And uh, we went to Zambia around December, and that is their, their monsoon season because in the southern continent, so that's when the rainy season is. and some different amanitas in the basket. Okay, next one, I'm gonna do a, a double click on all the different tente. This is their favorite, one of their favorite mushrooms. I wanted to spend some time to show you different pictures of that. Here, here's how they grow. It's uh, really out of this world to find this amanita. They look like some alien or an ostrich dropped eggs on the ground and this is how they look like these amanitas. And they can grow to be really big, like, like an ostrich egg. Ooh. Big Amanita eggs. There's a girl with a little bucket of Amanita. Really, kids really excited when they find them. So these are the ones that because they're so dirty, they don't pick them whole, they just sort of snap the the stem and just keep the cap because I'm not worried about, you know, cleaning, they just snap it and then they go cook with it or something. So I don't pick it whole. We picked it whole because, you know, for identification and documentation purposes, there's me with my basket of Amanita. And if you cook with them, they have these kind of book-like gills together. And they have a very, very fragrant smell that is very different than anything that I've eaten before. So they, they, they're a really neat mushroom to try and experiment with. And so as in, um, I told you in Yunnan, their preparation is mainly with garlic, chili, pepper. And in, in Zambia, they have kind of similar theme where they only use two, two or three ingredients for the mushrooms and their favorite is onions and tomato. So they'll cook any kind of mushrooms with onions and tomato and kind of make it into a stew. And then another preparation that it would do is they use um, peanuts, which I call ground nuts there. And then they mix it with the ground nuts and cook it into a, a peanut mushroom stew. This is just, you know, our, our version of tomato and onions with the tente amanita mushrooms and their local okra. And then we try grilling some which is also good and drying them. There are a couple of kids who are shy to get their picture taken. So the, that's all the tente, and, which is the Amanita. The next one I'm gonna show you is the different chanterelles. Hmm? Video? Not the end. Okay. So this is the uapaka tree and this is the uapaka fruit. And this is where the, the really colorful chanterelles like to grow with. So these chanterelles love to grow that uapaka and they're just so beautiful, really stunning mushrooms, Afrocantharellus. There's me and Marjorie collecting them and vigorously washing them because they're small and they have um, a lot of sand stuck in their, their gills. So it's, it's, it's just, rinse and wash a couple of times and then everything is clean and ready to go. Here's some women with uh, uh, buckets of mushrooms on the head to go to the market for sale. I'm very impressed. I think we took a lot of pictures of that. Oh, and then I don't have like separate market pictures, but I wanted to share that because they don't really have big markets like Yunnan. What happens is when you drive around the country, they will wave you down with their mushrooms 
And then if you want to buy it, you just stop and roll down your window. And then it's almost like a drive through where you can pick the ones you want, pay for it, and then take it with you. So this is sort of their, their version of uh, selling mushrooms for a commercial from the villagers to make extra money. And these chanterelles, I mixed these chanterelles and made a broth. Their broth is absolutely decadent. It's really, really good. Just some mushroom cooking added in there. I, I love to cook with mushrooms. And this is just a um, stir fry some chanterelles, saute them, and then I made a um, Amanita egg omelet on egg. But they don't have a lot of ingredients, so there's only so much you can do. They have a lot of onions and tomatoes for sale. You go to the market and they have long stalls, but every single person is selling onions and tomatoes. You kind of like feel bad if you just buy it from one person, not the other. So I tend to buy like a couple here, a couple there, but at the end of the day, they're all onions and tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. And then we picked some uapaca and then there were some um, pomegranate trees. So we tried to incorporate it in our meal as well. And yeah, more, more pictures of, of ladies holding basket. I, I'm, it's gonna be life goal for me one day. Yeah, chanterelles. And then um, next, this is just a, a, a different mixed mushrooms of different kinds that they eat as well. This is a, they call it cabanza mushroom, is a lactarius. And cabanza in Bamba means um, like soccer field. So these you see these on the ground on roadways, they just call them cabanza. And then there's a couple of um, Amanita tente there. And this woman is selling uh, different mushrooms. And there's one that I've tried this year here in California. Um, it's called the, uh, this one, clavelina. clavelina. They are selling clavelina and then we'll be eating clavelina and it's really delicious too, the ones over here. They, they help us understand that it's like edible and good. So then I was unafraid when I saw the clavelina here just to try it and it's really good as well. Yeah. And this is a, a electrician that we met and he loves the cabanza and he's, he has diabetes. And he was telling us that he, during the season, he eats this every day and it's helping with his diabetes. And this is schizophilum. So we bought some dry schizophilum and they eat that as well in a peanut stew and um, some amanitas that we've collected. I'm oh, sorry, Ursula, sorry. And then, um, and then washing mushroom as well. They don't have like a faucet running water in some of these villages. So they just get buckets of water and then they, they just soak and wash their mushrooms, their house. There's a little girl with her little stove getting ready to cook. Yeah. Market, people going to the market. And um, this was a dinner that the fam uh, one of the villagers, village family made us. And this is, this plate is different sampling of different kinds of Amanita that we tried that night, all seven, edible. Seven. seven kinds, seven different kinds of Amanitas. They grill them and then they put them in, uh, some of them they cook with uh, tomatoes and onions and they fried some as well. Here is some um, Busefue, which is a lactarius that they eat there. This, this is very interesting, it's really delicious and it kind of tastes like, uh, like a um, crunchy mushroom that is really robust. It's hard to describe. I think some, someone told me they thought it, it tasted kind of like if, if you eat like kidneys or liver, kind of like that. More uh, different lactarius that they eat. And they, they like to grill their mushrooms. Because after they grill it, you can dry it and then save it to eat later. There's some chanterelles and some lactarius on the market. Here's a lady selling her, her safe way, the lactarius. As you can see, like they sell bundles. You can pick a bundle that you want and take home. Okay. Last but not least, termite mushrooms. So termite mushrooms, 
These are ones that are cultivated by termites. So they have small ones and big ones and different kinds of termites have different relationship with different mushrooms. So there's these smaller ones that I've showed you before that was growing in someone's house. They're also growing in the garden. And they just grow wherever they're cultivated by the termites. It's an aloe. And on the side of the wall, and then they're cleaning it up for a meal. And they typically um, put them in a soup. And this is the big termite mushroom. These are the ones that I think you can see pictures of in the, the, the web stream about these huge termite mushrooms are really big. So it's just the contrast of the size of the little termite mushroom and the big termite mushroom, they are huge. So one of these can probably feed a family or two because they're so big. You can't just walk in your room, but you gotta turn your mushroom sideways to go through the door. Wendy, what species are those small termite mushrooms? Mycocarpus. Mycocarpus? Yeah. yeah. Termatomyces mycocarpus. Thank you. And this is the uh, Termatomyces gigan Titanicus. Titanicus. And you can see here, this man really pulled up that tap root. The termites are really deep down there, you know, feeding the mushrooms and, and cultivating them, and then they grow up. So are those the biggest mushrooms in the world? Maybe, uh, I think it's not mass wise now, but in terms of maybe the width. Yeah, the width, but the mass one, I think Flutopus is the bigger mushroom that they're heavier. heavier, but these are actually like bigger in terms of like, the cap size. Like a real umbrella. Yeah. So like, this, this, this long thing, is that mycelium or what is that? What, what is hanging on the big one? It's a tap root for the fruiting body. It's the stem. The stem. It's part of the stem that goes all the way no, down the mycelium. The stem. Huh. Yeah, it's throughout the, 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 the termite colony. That's the mycelium. So this picture here, I just want to show you, this is a button. Wow. And then, so uh, we, we got one of these big mushrooms and they, they do go bad really quickly and they get wormy. So we are, we're tearing in the, them up as we're driving across the country and drying them on, on the car. And this, this is an interesting picture because I think I was driving, David was taking this picture and after he took the picture, there's like, you can't tell like if you're on the right side or the left side of the road because there's two oncoming car coming to the side. <laughs> So there's a little bit of chaos going on, but then in front of us, there's the, there's a bus that says we can't change the past, but we can create the future. And I thought that was super hopeful for like things that we're going through every day. <laughs> As it's plowing into head on traffic. That's right. <laughs> and we bought out dehydrators there so we can actually dehydrate some of these um, termite mushrooms. So we would grill them to cook them. And then we dehydrate them and bring them home so we can enjoy it in the States. Here's another button of termite mushroom. And this is the lady Victoria who showed us how to grill the, the mushrooms over charcoal fire and preserve them. Here is this really big termite mushroom. You can see it's an umbrella size. Is Victoria grilling and uh, grilling with uh, a buck in the back? Bush buck. Bush buck in the back, watching us grill. And um, because we can't, uh, we have so many mushrooms, we gave some to others to help process, grill, and eat. As they grill them, do they kind of marinate them with some oil or spices or just a pure mushroom? Just a pure mushroom. Uh-huh. Yeah. They don't have the restaurants. They yeah. You know, but this is a hotel. Oh, a hotel, yeah. So. so they reminded me that, like, they don't have restaurants and you know, we can bring the mushrooms that they cook for us, but we can bring it. Like, this is from a hotel. We just bring it to them and then they have these little charcoal grill um, portable things that they can help us do that. So they're like essentially dry and crispy. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're dry and crispy, 
and then you can just eat them straight like that and you can save it sure. for later like like a jerky yeah mm. and here's finding our own which is really exciting and here's my big ones and little ones okay i think that's all of the pictures that i'm that i'm going to show you and i'm going to pause here for questions on on zambia so the video oh right sorry video. i have a video too one second that let me get there this is the, the tente uh, mushroom. And I just wanted to share with you that, that um, Marjorie, one of our friends and villagers there was telling us that, talk about mushroom love and culture. They have songs that they sing during the wedding and the children learn when they're really little about this mushroom. And I've asked her to sing it and uh, we, we had a recording of it. But the theme of the song is something about the special mushroom I'm picking you and I'm picking you for myself. So there's some like connotation about their vervent love of this mushroom. Let's see if we can play. Oops, one second. Let me press the play button. I have a lot of these um, Zoom windows open. Let me get the play buttons on for you. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> So that's the Tente song. It's really beautiful. Um, then this is the video of Marjorie picking the Afrocanthorellus. Hopefully it's not too jumpy and you can see it. So that's how they grow on the ground with the Uapaka trees. You can see that they're like little ones everywhere. Chitondo is their local name for chanterelle. So Marjorie has this technique where she picks the mushroom and it's very sandy. She would pick them and she has um, a technique where she just throws it up in the air and sort of sift through the, the sand will fall off. <laughs> and that helps keep the mushrooms clean. Yeah, so that's uh, mushroom picking in Zambia. Let's see. Um, just to review a little bit, these are the different mushrooms that I showed you in the presentation. There's many other ones, but I just want to highlight a few that you may want to try when you get to Yunnan, China. And then these are the ones from uh, Zambia and there's many undescribed species. So then this, I, I can list everything, but something to look for. So again, how can you tell if you're in a mushroom loving culture is the access to mushroom hunting, the diversity of mushrooms that they collect and how available they are in the markets and, and restaurants in those, in those different countries. Okay, acknowledgement time. So thank you, David. So this is, I think one of his first trip in, in um, Zambia. And then uh, just thanking Aaron and David Ansley for hosting. And I will be, here as long as we want to talk about mushrooms or have any Q&A. Cool. Thank you so much, Wendy. Oh, fabulous. Thanks Terrific. for inviting me. Yeah, and it was like a twofer. We had David Aurora and you here. So it was like big night. That, that was like the coolest. I don't know. Like I, I get into the DNA sequencing talks and all of that. Uh, but this is like, like, like David said, it's like mushroom porn. It's like, uh, it's like, oh, it's so cool to hear about all of that. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, are there any questions? I'm gonna, I'll, ch I'll check um, the the chat to see if there are questions. Have I tried a telephora? Yes, I have. It's really good. It's uh, kind of chewy and crunchy, like jerky but with a nice flavor and they like to, to put it in chili oil. So you like spicy. It's really delicious. 
What is this? We can try our local here? ones here. The Telephora? Yeah. Have you tried it? No, I haven't tried the local time, one. Uh, David I has. He doesn't remember. So if anyone finds some, we'll feed it to him. Yeah. Um, Wendy, I have a question about um, access. Um, the land that they were picking on, was it theirs? Was it just sort of common land? How, you know? What, yeah, so- the, What rules were they following when they're out there picking for themselves and for market? Yeah, it's all common grounds. It's like in their village and people come to their village. It's kind of shared commons. And in, 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 um, in Zambia, there are places that are more private that we got permission to go. So those would be places that are like on people's farms that is private and we just ask for permission. Like we wanna study mushroom, we wanna um, pick mushrooms and we ask for permission. The answer is always yes, come and pick mushrooms. That's great, thanks. So and um, the time of the year in Zambia is, is in the November, December, January timeframe. That's where the monsoon is happening. But what happens is when the monsoon is happening is usually not a good time for game because to, to view game, you, you want to go where all the leaves have um, fallen so they can get a better chance of viewing different and uh, bigger diversity and amounts of different wildlife there. Do you think that in both uh, other cultures, Chinese and African, that the families um, teach their children much more than what we do here? I think so. I mean, different things. I think, I think here, especially in the countryside, they have like limited time in school. And I think in our culture here, at least I can speak for like growing up in the Bay Area and have like friends and family that have kids it's really regimented. They have their school and then the after school activities. And then they're, you know, getting ready for the next thing. And there's not a lot of exploration. Even the summer is, is, uh, it's occupied by all these activities like camp and all that. So there's probably less exploration. I see a lot of kids in these other countries, they have a lot of outside playtime on their own. And, um, so they, they learn by doing, and then they, they, they're unafraid to like be little adults. If I may, yeah. Is there much of a problem that you you know of with uh, like mushroom poisoning in those countries? I mean, they seem to eat almost everything they find. Uh, they, they must know their mushrooms pretty well, but I mean, still. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. Um, most because like in Yunnan, usually when we take mushrooms to restaurant, they would only cook the ones that they know. So if, if you're bringing ones from another area that they don't know, they don't cook. So they don't, they won't cook it for us because they don't, they don't want to be associated with cooking as a poison mushroom or they don't, they don't know that one. So it's pretty much regional that they know a certain kinds, even in Africa, like if they go to another village and another village eats one kind of mushroom and their village doesn't eat it, then they'll avoid it. Oh. So I think in, in that, in that sense, it's, it's pretty limited in terms of the poisoning. Well, um, and I think there's like some documented poisoning that David can talk about. There's definitely poisonings there, but I think the, most of them happened because uh, nowadays people are moving around a lot more. So they may take their knowledge from one area that's very good there and take it to another area and get into trouble. And that happens from also from uh, going from one country to another two, but also from, from one region within the country to another. So I, I think a lot of times it's that also people are becoming more urban, but they may remember distantly some mushroom that they picked as a child and then they see something and they think, oh, maybe that's that mushroom. So oh. as long as they're in, in the countryside and they're staying within their knowledge base, they're really safe, I think. Yeah, and I and I think that there was another um, mushroom poisoning case of people buying mushrooms. I think in in the Chinese market because some like for especially I think for um, city people that don't know mushrooms in China they would just buy and and eat. And sometimes there's like a mixed collection of dried mushrooms that maybe 
not as good or, or poisonous that they don't know of and they cook it all the same and that that can get them in, into trouble because we were well yeah. i would say in you know the the responsibility is on the customer the person who gets the mushroom i saw this uh a villager selling some amanitas that i thought were kind of iffy i didn't know that they were poisonous but i I never heard of anybody eating them. And I asked him in Chinese if he ate them. And he said, no. And I said, well, are they edible? Can you eat them? And he says, no. And I said, well, why are you selling them? And he says, because somebody might buy them. So uh, the responsibility there is just a different view. Like the, the customer going to the market is like the mushroom hunter going to the forest here. They have this incredible array of mushrooms and they can have any mushroom they want, but they've got to know yeah. themselves. Wow. The good ones. That's so it's very now, different. That doesn't happen often, but that does happen occasionally. That I see once, it could have been edible, I don't know, but he didn't know either. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know. Try it. They're no. just picking them and bringing them to customers to choose what they want, basically. Yeah. So it's very different for sure. So have to be careful. Um, did I encounter any large animal while foraging in Zambia or Yunnan? So I in, in Zambia, not a large animal, but they have a lot of poisonous snakes. So uh, note to self, the next time I go to Zambia, I'm going to wear really long boots because there are so many snakes there. I bent down to look at a Rusula and there was a spitting cobra right where I was about to pick the mushroom. And I jumped back like three feet. And then the, the spitting cobra went up, weird up like this and was like looking at me and I was looking at it and then both thought, okay, we're going to keep a respectful distance. Then it like slithered back and I just left the area. So there are have to be careful about poisonous snakes there. And then there are no big animals. We saw ronins from far away and some um, crocodiles. Yeah, most of the game are in national parks there. And those are areas that have different habitat that don't have a lot of mycorrhizal mushrooms. So we were hunting habitats that didn't have. Yeah. A lot of dangerous game anyway. And then in, in Yunnan, where we were just like surrounded by people a lot, a, a lot of the time. So I didn't see any animals except for farm animals, really, like pigs and cows and horses and stuff. What other mushroom tourist destination do, do you know of? I um, uh, would love to talk about Japan. Um, it, it's a really fun place to be and also a fun place to mushroom hunt. And Italy, um, Europe, Italy Europe. Eastern Europe, um, Portugal, Mexico, uh, Spain. So th those are some of the areas that um, are, are good. And of course, like, you know, the Eastern Europe. The question about um, the chanterelles, the variety of chanterelles, they were so different, um, like looking compared to like, Ours, there might have been like one or two that was similar. So is there a singular characteristic to identify them? Like, for instance, you know, when we get our when we get our um, golden or white chanterelles or rainbow chanterelles, they're like string cheese. They're so different. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it like the, 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 the current gills and then also the fragrance, they have a really fruity flavor. You smell them. They have, they all have this wonderful, like tropical peach fruit flavor. Mm. So any other questions for Wendy? This is, and David, this is amazing. What a view into, you know, deep into your world. I felt like I had kind of a, a good grasp of fungal life around here. And now I'm just like, I know nothing. I don't know anything about mushrooms at all. Like, oh my gosh, I want to, I want to go travel out there. That's so cool. I feel the same, Aaron. I thought we are a good mushroom culture, but look at that. We are nothing. 
you go to our market, we have one mushroom, you know, may, maybe some oysters and shiitake, you know, in the gourmet section, but uh, it's really sad compared to these other countries that have mountains of mushrooms that apparently get sold. Yeah. <laughs> That so was really interesting because I was in um, Zambia and I bought my very first termite mushroom. I was really excited. It's really beautiful. It's really big. And I'm just like proudly carrying it down the market. And then this market lady comes to me and said, do you know what that is? And I said, yeah, I know what it is. Do you know it's edible? Yes, I know it's edible. And she's like, do you know how to cook it? And I'm like, no, what do you recommend? And then she just started to tear my mushroom apart. And I was saving it for a picture, but she wanted to show me how to cook it and how to like not use a knife and you're supposed to tear it. And then go like, like, oh my God, my mushroom just got destroyed. But they're so <laughs> happy to show you and share the joy of mushroom hunting. Oh, wow. So different. But I, um, I, I can't wait until kind of the more normalcy of the world so we can actually go travel and kind of geopolitical stuff get settled so then things will be easier. It's just been hard. Very, very old people by the way things are going. Mm. All right, any other questions or comments? Wendy, David, thank you so much. This has been just tremendous. And um, yeah, we should have you back after your next jaunt and find out what, you know, once the, uh, once it is safe to travel around and meet up with people everywhere, can't wait to hear what you found. Yeah, maybe we'll travel yeah, we'd to up. <laughs> we'll travel up to see you guys. Oh, that'd be so cool. Please do. Okay. Come and uh, show us how to cook some stuff for our picnic in, in, in July. That'd be cool. <laughs> for sure it'll be a lot of fun it'll be a lot of fun i i wouldn't reckon i wouldn't like say i i'm a great cook but i love to experiment and like to put things together and try well i said you're a great cook <laughs> <laughs> we we'll just have a lot of tomatoes and onions yeah you know anything is good with tomato onions and like garlic <laughs> and chili <laughs> you can't go wrong with garlic and chili I <laughs> oh i do uh, want to tell you that like this this past summer we were in the southwest you got so many bolites um porcini that i created this um mushroom hot sauce and i highly recommend trying if you have um lots of mushrooms to try it and cook your mushroom hot sauce your own chili crisp it's really really good so try it with like mushroom powder with porcini with like matsutake any excess mushroom you have and then cook it with ginger garlic chili and um chili sauce and make your own chili sauce and just store it and you can use it for your tacos and burritos and stir fries it's really amazing so try that out maybe mm. maybe i can get that from you and then uh and then post it on our uh on our on our website or on our facebook or something yep i'm not good with portions but i can share like all the ingredients and you guys can kind of mix it up and then you can like add things that you want because i like to add a little bit of like nuts as well so you get a little bit of like crunchiness to it so yeah love to share recipes yeah. is this sort of like is this sort of like making the um mushroom mushroom oyster sauce mushroom oyster sauce you mean like ketchup no like if you use oyster so chinese for chinese cooking oyster sauce but the one that's vegetarian that's made with mushrooms is that the same kind of thing oh uh, this is more like uh it's a sauce but it's more like chili oil with oh. the oil and then chopped up mushrooms and all the flavors in it so if you could you use that for a dipping sauce uh -huh. awesome. mm. eggs or something yeah, yeah. good stuff I got bags of dried porcinis i need to do something with so that sounds but good. did you try this um acrylic because that is kind of like a new idea to grill them and then still dry them i mean that sounds interesting it's really good. We have extra matsutake and we try that. So we, um, when we were doing fire abatement work here on the property, we had like burn piles and after the burn piles become charcoal and ash, we just put matsutake right onto, right onto it. So it cooks. So it has a little bit of smoky flavor. And then afterwards you just dry it on the dehydrator and then you can just, you know, use it as a mushroom jerky with huh. sake. It's really good. Huh. 
That sounds awesome. cool. Yeah, yeah, try that out if you have excess. <laughs> There's always a lot of fun things to try. Mm -hmm.